Shalom. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Bosco for inviting me for the sixth, seventh time I have given up counting, and uh, to Ms. Farah Kasim uh, for leading this effort. I was speaking last in May for CTET in uh, New York. I come from the most livable city in the world. Uh, economists each year select uh, the quality of life, and it's usually Zurich or Melbourne, sometimes Vancouver, but more often than not, it is Vienna. And in the summer, uh, in front of the Rathaus in Vienna, there is a film festival, entry free, on a huge screen you can see ballet and theater and movies. And in the announcement it says, no security. There are a couple of bollards left and right, but no security. Well, that could deter some frightful people to go there, but it's always full two, three thousand people every evening, except when it's raining, which is not uh, that often. And uh, it could be an invitation for terrorists, but for years uh, nothing has happened. My talk is a bit different from those you've heard. Uh, my practice in counterterrorism was back in 1970 when I was uh, guarding Cloton Airport as part of the Swiss Army, but uh, most of my work has been academic. Now, for a terrorist act to occur, you need a motivated perpetrator, a suitable target, and the absence of capable guardians. Soft targets are, by definition, no or uh, few guardians are there. There are plenty of uh, undefended or ill-defended crowded places, like the Rathaus in Vienna, that terrorists might find suitable. So what can be done in terms of preventing terrorist attacks on such targets? Uh, I have to use the PowerPoints here. Yeah. When I was in charge of the terrorism prevention branch, I had neither the money nor the mandate nor the time to write a handbook on terrorism prevention, but that's what I'm doing now together with almost 40 uh, colleagues. And because I want it to be available for everybody, the 1,000 pages will be put online for free at the website of ICCT in uh, January or February of uh, this year. And to put everybody in that volume on the same place, uh, I proposed these definitions of prevention. Prevention is a subject everybody is in favor for, but there is no real theory of prevention, because a theory of prevention would presuppose a theory of the future. And uh, while we all like to spend the rest of our lives there, we don't really know how it will uh, turn out. But uh, usually things are trending from the past. So to know the past, uh, the past is a Shakespeare said prologue. So if you want to be a futurologist, it helps uh, if you are a historian, which is what I studied. Uh, well, uh, Ms. Kasim has already told you what uh, soft and hard target are. This list of targets are all places where actually attacks uh, took place, so they are not something that comes out of my imagination. When you look at terrorism, you have to go back to the 19th century, when two inventions came together, the invention of dynamite and the rotary place, and that created a new situation where terrorists no longer had to paste a poster on uh, the city hall announcing why they killed a person they didn't like. It was done by the commercial press. And uh, that power has uh, gone up uh, tremendously. When I started looking into terrorism in the early 70s, the Munich Olympic Games, TV brought the news of the attack on the Israeli athletes to 500 uh, million people almost simultaneously. Now you can reach uh, 4 billion people through the social things. So that is the basic structure of a uh, terrorist attack. There's a physical target of violence, there's a psychological target of terror, 
there are targets of coercive demands and targets of attention. But in fact, the situation is a bit more complicated because the signaling of terrorists goes to a whole group of people. Some of them have to be deterred, others have to be won over and influenced. The media, of course, are the <coughs> medium to get that out to the world. Now, in such a situation, you can harden soft targets, but there are too many soft targets. And hardening one would mean displacement in many uh, cases. The thing is, the terrorists don't really care where they have their attack, whether it is in New Zealand or in Munich, as long as it's online and on the air. So it is the TV screen, your computer screen, that is where it has to be to have the effect. Now, I cannot talk about all these uh, types of uh, terrorism. I'll concentrate on religious terrorism and more in particular on uh, jihadism. What is determining uh, the selection of targets? Well, research has shown that ideology is the biggest determinant. But of course, news value uh, and opportunities and all these factors play a role capabilities, opportunities, strategies. But the strongest of them is ideology. Or that's even true for uh, non-religious uh, uh, parties like nationalists, extremists. These are data from uh, uh, 1965 to 2005. And if you look, uh, you see uh, that uh, representatives of the state uh, are targeted by some groups, uh, nationalists uh, and leftists, and uh, vigilantes, and those on the extreme right typically target uh, the common uh, people. If I look at some other research, uh, i just bring in some quotes. What comes out is that soft targets are the main targets, especially for single actors. And uh, most uh, soft target attacks by single actors uh, go undetected because they give very few signals that can be picked up. Whether these attacks are completed, which is the word the Europol uses, uh, I, first they used succeeded, but I said take completed. It, uh, it's a bit uh, less uh, granting them victory. Uh, here, the literature is very, very differing. Uh, according to one data set, 80% of the non-single issue targets could be prevented, while others, uh, the IVD, the Dutch Intelligence uh, Service, says, uh, no, it's the other way around. It's almost 80% succeeded. It's growing. In the Handbook of Terrorism Research and Preparation, I uh, use this tripartition of where uh, prevention can take place, upstream, uh, midstream, uh, downstream. And most of the preventive measures that are on the market and have been presented here at this table are very much uh, midstream and downstream. But in fact, a lot can be done upstream. And uh, just to give you a quote, from a large study based on the global terrorism database for the years 1990 to 2015, there are two factors that make countries vulnerable. One is if they are repressive, uh, not very repressive. The most repressive countries, there's only one terrorism, that's the state. But it's in the middle, not democratic, but more authoritarian. That's one factor. And that is a big factor. And if you stick to the rule of law, if you are uh, sticking to human rights, it helps enormously in preventing revenge acts. And terrorist acts are often revenge acts. A new book by Tom Parker, Avoiding the Terrorist Trap, Why Respect for Human Rights is the Key to Defeating Terrorism on 800 plus pages, demonstrates this with multiple cases. The other thing is, 
if you are not engaged in military adventures abroad, sometimes abroad is not so abroad, like in the Irish case, your chances of getting becoming a target are also smaller. But not all countries have the luxury of uh, choosing that. Imperial countries like the United States that have now armed uh, units in 80 countries in their global war on terror are in a different situation than a small state. So when it comes to a terrorist act, between the planning and the execution, there is a time window. How big is that time window? When terrorists engage in sort of preparatory act, they surface, they rob a bank, uh, they get police uniforms to uh, fake uh, that they are other units and so that window can be uh, a couple of weeks, can be a couple of months, and that's where you can pick up uh, signals. The 9-11 report showed that there were, for instance, 23 opportunities to intervene by security forces, intelligence forces, and they were all missed. But uh, it is important that you pick up these things. I have uh, thought about if the soft target is really undefended, which is the definition of a soft target, what can you do? And I th came up with uh, 13 layers of preventive measures that you can take ahead of potential attacks. This is, I uh, should have showed you that a bit earlier. It basically shows the sequence of a typical attack. And these layers of prevention that uh, I uh, propose, uh, basically, uh, they can be simultaneously. They can uh, the sequence can be a different one, but a lot can be done in terms of picking up early signals. Uh, this can be done partly by think tanks like RAND or academic units like the Global Terrorism, uh, terrorism Database of START, and now taken over partly by George Mason University. Then you have the internet as a second sieve where you can pick up enormous amount of data. Think, for instance, of hate speech in the wake of a terrorist attack, uh, where so many people express their thumbs up for a terrorist attack. Well, these people that give these sort of signals are people uh, to uh, be watched. Then the third layer is the surveillance and eavesdropping. And despite uh, encryption, the terrorist, uh, the internet is really a big opportunity for phishing. You see how all our data, bank data, and all sorts of other data are exposed. And that gives unique opportunities. However, the reliance on that sort of sources has led in many agencies to a neglect of human intelligence. And uh, that is still the most reliable method to get at information, apart from, of course, uh, and that is especially true for international transnational terrorism, the exchange of information, which is and continues to be a bottleneck due to an incomplete trust uh, between agencies within a country and uh, between uh, countries. Then the remaining levels of uh, prevention, well, I don't want to uh, comment on them all because we are running a bit against time. But uh, some of them have already uh, been mentioned by my colleagues here, issue warnings via the mass media that uh, sort of make the terrorists panicking that happened in Belgium after the attacks on uh, the airport in <coughs> the IRA has sometimes issued warnings uh, so that the guilt if the bomb is not detected in time is uh, placed on the authorities but all these things can be layers where you have uh, midstream and downstream intervention opportunities and uh, I compared these uh, things that I came up with with those that had been 
developed by a working group of the Global Counterterrorism uh, Forum, which is a cooperation of 29 uh, states plus the European Union. And they also developed uh, in several working sessions held in Singapore and elsewhere. Uh, it ha also happened to be 13 measures that could be taken. And there is an overlap of four measures with those that I propose. In the Antalya Memorandum that produced uh, that uh, 13 points uh, of good practices, uh, the working group of the Global Counterterrorism Forum concluded that protecting, and I quote, soft targets is complex. This is a perennial and practical struggle to balance security and access, and the target set is virtually unlimited. If casualties are the paramount terrorist metric for success, then every undefended group of people becomes a lucrative target. Uh, many years ago, uh, Brian Jenkins, who is with us, uh, wrote, terrorists want a, don't want a lot of people dead, they want a lot of people watching. Well, uh, 30 years later, in 2004, he said, corrected it, they also want a lot of people dead, some of them. So what I propose is that we work further upstream with these filters or layers and that uh, putting one layer on top of the next will help us to uh, recover uh, and prevent uh, terrorism. If we start hardening all targets, we are also closing down open society, and that is a price that is too high to pay. If you want more details on that, uh, give me your card and I can send you my 45-page uh, paper that goes into many more details. I just surfed through the text here, but I hope we have some opportunity uh, for questions and there are still two more speakers, so I leave it at that. Thank you for your attention.